Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusker, here for another episode of the show. And uh, real quick, when we talked about the whole podcasting thing, um, it's great to have this remote control for the camera, but the ZI8, if you don't have it doing anything, after like two or three minutes, it turns off. This remote won't turn on the camera. So kind of the whole point of having the remote, so I don't have to get up. But anyway, I had to get up to, to go look some something up between, uh, between episodes. All right, so let's get going here. All right, so this wine, I'll be honest, I have no idea what to expect from this. I'm a little scared, a little scared about it. But, um, and not because it's called the Bull's Blood, Bull's Blood of Edgar. Um, anyway, this is, uh, I bought this wine with the intention of the whole wine around the world thing is from Hungarian, Hung Hungary, it's Hungarian wine. And, uh, right, Hungarian? Yes, Hungarian. I have, I have some Bulgarian wine, too, but Hungarian wine. This is the 2007 Egri Bikaver uh, Bull's Blood of Egger Dry Red Quality Wine, 2007. Um, this is, again, from Hungary. Uh, the area of Hungary is from is kind of the northeast-ish area of Hungary. Um... What was I going to say here? Uh, I don't know why I have just Edgar up on the book of knowledge here, aka Wikipedia. Um, some, sometime, someday, somebody's going to catch the reference uh, why I call it the book of knowledge. Anyway, um, the company is called Vitavin, and um, they've been producing wine, well, Hungary's been producing wine forever, but this particular winery was founded in 1990. Um, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the city, the town that it's in. Well, actually, let's try it. Felsotarkane. No. Felsotarkane. And it's got a bunch of accents in there, so I don't speak Hungarian, so I probably completely destroyed it. Um, but anyway, um, it is one of the longest standing wine, re wine regions in Hungary. Um, they have 116 hectares. And uh, they call the grapes blue grapes instead of red or black. Um, so 80% of the vineyards are blue grapes. And um, the grapes that they use, now the one thing about this one, oh, I bought it at Specs for $7.39. Uh, one of the things about this, this particular style of wine, um, the Egri Bikaver, um, is that uh, it can, it's made from a bunch of different grapes, or it can use, uh, has to contain at least three of 13 grapes. Almost sounds like shot them off the pop, because there's 13 grapes or 11 grapes, depending on how you count them. Um, but uh, we'll run through those real quick. Uh, and, and a lot of these are native to Hungary. So, Kadarka, uh, Kekfrankos, or Blauf, Blaufrankisch um, in German, okay? which is, uh, I think that's Pinot Noir, the German word for Pinot Noir. <laughs> um, Blauer Portugieser, and in Hungarian it's Kekaporto. Um, Cabernet Sauvignon, hey, here, hey, some grapes we're familiar with. Cabernet Franc, Merlot. Minoir, also known as Kek Medoc, or Medoc Noir. Um, Pinot Noir, Syrah, Tiran, Bibur Kadarka, and the modern Austrian hybrids Blauberger and Zweigelt. That's just, I love saying Zweigelt. It's like, uh, um, uh, oh, well, who's the German player on soccer? Um, Schweinsteiger. I like just saying Schweinsteiger. Um, he's actually a pretty good player for the, German, uh, for the German national team. I forgot who he plays for his club team, but the German national team. 
Um, anyway, so I don't know what's in this one if, per se, but um, they, they have grapes. And the grapes that they have uh, planted are Lean, uh, Lignaca, uh, Muscatali, Tramini, Chardonnay, Pinot Blanc, and Sauvignon Blanc. So um, I don't really know what's in this particular one, but we, I'm going to be tasting some grapes I've never tasted before, so I'm excited about that. So let's check it out. Um, I actually want to say it's kind of cloudy. Maybe a little bit. Well, maybe it's kind of clear. It just looks really kind of cloudy. It doesn't look bright or star bright as far as the um, as far as the color. Wow. Basement. Okay. Like old basement with wood and it's not like the Italian wines where I talk about old accordion case where it's like the leather felt and dust. I mean, you get kind of that mustiness uh, basement. You get kind of that stone, stone work, a um, little bit of moldy mustiness to it. Uh, but you can smell like wood furniture. Like, you know, like honestly, it kind of reminds me of one of my aunts, uh, the, the old house that my aunt and uncle lived in and my cousins grew up in. Um, and their basement up in New Jersey, up in Powell Park. Okay, shout out to the Dirty Jers. It kind of reminds me of that. And also a little bit of my grandmother's uh, basement. Um, kind of a shame we don't have basements here in, in Texas, at least not in San Antonio. Basements are cool. Um, so I get really a lot of that type of stuff. I get the minerality, I get some wood, I get some earthiness to it. Um, fruit wise, I don't really get a whole lot of fruit to be honest. I mean, maybe some red fruit, generically red fruit. Because they call the grapes blue grapes, maybe I'm getting some blueberry as kind of the power suggestion. And I want to actually say I get a little bit of tobacco on there too, which I rarely get tobacco. I know it's in a lot of wines, but I don't normally pick up on it. And I'll be honest, I should, I'm not a smoker, but I should pick up tobacco smell. I'm really intrigued now. I'm like really kind of jazzed about trying this now. So let's see how it tastes. Mmm. For the geek factor, this is a pretty neat and really kind of cool wine. I mean, I really like it. First off, it does have a bit of that sulfur firework flavor to it, which it's, it's a little bit. It's not very overpowering, but it's somewhat noticeable. Kind of a smoke bomby thing, which that can be considered a flaw or a fault. If you're kind of sensitive to it, you might kind of not turn your nose up, but be kind of like, Ugh. I did it tonight. I was trying a wine and I told the bartender that either I just don't like it or it's off. And it had been open a couple, a few days. Well, not a few, but it's been open more than just a day or two. But um, I get a lot of what I got off of the nose. A lot of that basement uh, stone, um, minerality, uh, a little bit of that wood and almost like, not leather, but like, like, um, uh, cloth type of furniture. Um, I also get a bit of tartness, um, wood, definitely wood. Um, more of the red fruit, tart red fruit. So there's some acidity, also really good acidity to it, but there really is no finish to it. Um, it really finishes like water. So a very short finish on it. Um, I, I don't taste a lot of it, 
but I have the sensation from it, from the acid. Um, my mouth is still watering. Um, it's intriguing. I, I, I can see having some more of this. You know, it's what, you know, $7, seven, eight dollars. Um, I get almost like ragweed cactus type of component to it. Almost like uh, you walk into one of those like old timey furniture stores. Um, you get well, not a potpourri, but you get that 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 sense of of wood to it. It's interesting, very interesting. If you are looking for something that's completely off the beaten path. Um, you know, it's not your typical, even European wine. In this taste, European. Like, I, like you're, I mean, you're in Eastern Europe. I mean, it, it's old country. This is not just old world. This is old country. Old country wine. I can imagine this is, you know, some dude's backyard. And he, and he made it, this is what his wine tastes like. And this is his everyday drinking wine. You know, you got that, that, that guy is just, you know, has been works out in the fields all the time. He's like super tan, but not like super tan like you know Hollywood tan, but like you know worker type of tan. You know, calloused hands has the the cool little like you know the hat on. You know, and just you know he's probably freaking awesome to talk to. That's who I picture when I drink this wine. Okay. And just on the nose, I mean, I was catching hints of tobacco and maybe a little caramel. Just like the rosé, I don't think this was affected by all of the fact I had opened it, vacuumed it, and put it in a refrigerator. Um, the bottle is still kind of cool to the touch. Um, the wine is definitely not quote room temperature but again when you serve red wine you're really supposed to serve it almost 10 degrees colder than what our room temperature our typical room temperature is so depending on the red wine some red wines they want you to, to, to serve like 65 66 degrees other red wines they want you to like almost serve like 55 uh, to 60 degrees and maybe even a little bit cooler but it's interesting, just, just for the interest factor alone, buy the wine. Now, how would I score the wine? Well, it's, it's a bit foreign to me, I mean, but let's think about the quality of the wine and how, how it's made. I think it's a well-made wine, and I'm gonna make some assumptions here that it's supposed to taste a certain way, and that I'm tasting, that I'm tasting what it's supposed to be. Um, I think it's a well-made wine. Um, I'm gonna deduct a few points for the finish. It's a very short finish. Um, <clears throat> But the acids there, the tannins are not overpowering at all. They're, they're kind of medium minus, it, it, to be honest. The acid's kind of medium plus. Um, it's not a sweet wine. I mean, it does say it's a dry red wine, okay? And honestly, I was really expecting something kind of sugar, not sugar sweet, but sweet. But it said dry on when I bought the label. I was like, well, okay, we'll see what their dry means. Um, but in the EEU, and we're gonna get to that later on this show, um, there is a, uh, or there are, actually um, regulations on what you can call dry and sweet and demi, demi sec and all that. I'd, I'd buy it just for the pure cool coolness factor. I mean, bull's blood wine. Uh, story behind why it's called bull's blood wine. Um, there was a siege in, I think it was in Edgar, um, and the, the, the populace was given wine that was supposedly laced with bull's blood that gave them their strength to defend the city. That's why it's called Bull's Blood. All right, we're gonna move on to the next wine. Uh, Score-wise, I'm gonna give it an 84. I'm gonna not, not put it in the 85 to 90 range, um, and really it's because of the finish, but it's still a, a, a good quality wine, and I would suggest getting it. All right, again, if you're looking for something to read, to learn about wine, uh, again, this is the first book I picked up, the Wine for Dummies book. Again, this is the five-in-one version, so um, it has got a lot of other stuff that I probably should read, but I, I probably have already read the, the more in-depth books. But definitely buy it. Click the link below to uh, take you to Amazon to uh, buy it. 
and uh, we're going to move on to the next wine. All right, now we're back with uh, our pre premium wine segment. So um, again, over at Central Market, HEB Central Market here in San Antonio, uh, I went ahead and uh, bought another one of these. Now I was trying to kind of, you know, buy wines from different places, and um, this one caught my eye because I was really looking for an Australian wine. This is the Shingleback 2006 Shiraz from the McLaren Valley. Um, there's the uh, label there. And uh, this is uh, from a winery in South Australia. Uh, they've been around for a little bit. Let's uh, kind of pull it up real quick. Um, the, um, it was founded by the owner's grandfather, or it was first farmed in 1957. And uh, the goal was to produce affordable wines. Now, I bought this wine for $25.99 at HEB. Granted, I had the 10% discount because I bought six bottles. Uh, I actually bought, what, seven or eight that day. But I bought si at least six bottles, and I got the 10% discount. So, um, uh, and this particular label, Shingleback, was started in 1998. So, uh, they've, they've been making this version of the wine for a while. Um, I'm not 100% sure it's, it's, I'm not 100% sure it's 100% Shiraz. Um, but we're just going to assume it is, okay? And uh, what was I? What else was I going to do with that? That was it, actually. All right, so let's check it out. Ooh. So we're getting chocolate, like almost milk chocolate type of thing. Almost like a chocolate covered cherry aspect. Ooh, that light just went out. Oh well, we'll replace it for the uh, Wine 101. It means I gotta go quick on this. By the way, these lights only last, these batteries only, only last about an hour ish. Kind of from two episodes ago. Almost like a raspberry and chocolate thing going on. Okay, so not chocolate, but cocoa. Like, you know, chocolate milk, cocoa type of stuff, you know, hot cocoa. Um, really the pie aspect, getting really a lot of kind of that raspberry type of thing. Um, a little bit of um, cherry. Um, I'm really digging it. Decent finish. Uh, it's at a medium to medium plus finish at least. I'm actually still tasting it. Uh, kind of high in the acid. Um, you know, it's got some good acid to it. Tannins, I would say a medium-ish tannins. I know we're not supposed to put medium-ish when we describe these things officially. So we'll see medium, medium minus, medium plus. So maybe it's like a medium and a half plus. You can taste the influence of the oak, but it's not overpowering. Um, it, it just adds to the whole complexity of the wine. It's tasty. It's pretty darn tasty. Um, I like it a lot. It's not overly jammy, but it's got that it's got that boldness that you kind of expect from Australian Shirazes. Um, I really, really enjoy it. I mean, it's going to be a quick, well, because the light's out. I'm going to be really quick with this wine. Um, but then again, the... Uh, <clears throat> sparkling wine segment for Wine 101 is probably going to be kind of long. Um, I've got the itchy nose today. i got to stop doing that. Um, I would definitely suggest buying it. I put it in 88. Um, $26. It is not cheap, um, but it's also not super expensive. So if you're looking for a kind of a nicer bottle of wine to enjoy uh, with, uh, with somebody or, or having something kind of nice to have with dinner um, at home, I, I totally would suggest getting this one.
And I can totally see this wine developing over time in the glass. Um, and you could decant this wine. It's going to open up some more. Um, it's, I want to call it a beautiful wine, but it's pretty darn good. 88, I think it's a really good wine. Um, it just, it doesn't go over the top for me to get to the 90, but I absolutely uh, would suggest getting it. That's going to do it for this segment. Um, we're going to move on to the next segment. It's going to be all about sparkling wine. How is it created? Um, so, yes, yeah, champagne's going to be part of it. But uh, how is sparkling wine created? And uh, so stay tuned for the next segment. All right, and we're back with uh, another uh, segment of Wine 101. We're going to talk about sparkling wine. All right, so... Fault or not? No, well, we talked about faults a couple weeks ago, right? Or three weeks ago. And um, historically, bubbles in wine were considered a fault. Um, it really only became acceptable in the 18th century. Um, and uh, uh, it's a fault, though, when it's not intended. So if you get a red, even like, okay, this, the rosé that I did last week, okay? If there's bubbles in there, it's a fault. It's not supposed to have bubbles in the wine. If I'm drinking a Prosecco, or a Champagne, or a Cava, or a Sect, or anything else that it's supposed to be sparkling, um, supposed to have bubbles, then it's okay. So let's talk about what was going on. All right, well, how does this happen? It's a second fermentation in the bottle. Well, not necessarily in the bottle, but it started off as a second fermentation in the bottle. Now, second fermentation is also used in, in, other, in other ways, but when we talk about the uh, how, how you get this, how you get the bubbles, it's considered a second fermentation. Um, it's it's done because there's residual sugar in the wine. Um, in the old days, when they would uh, store the wine, and you get into the to the late fall and winter time, winter months, uh, the yeast goes dormant. Depending on the strain of yeast you're, you're using. It needs to be, it's only can be active in certain temperature ranges. If it gets too cold, the yeast kind of goes, it's cold. I'm going to go to sleep for, you know, like a bear, like a hibernate, okay? So they go dormant. So you have this residual sugar that hasn't been um, converted into alcohol. Um, you also have uh, Brettanomyces. Uh, there's wood sugars that might be left over. Um, from the fermentation. These are unfermentable sugars. So, um, honestly, I don't remember why I put that in there. Uh, there's wood sugars that are going to be in the wine that are going to give you some residual sugar, but it's unfermentable sugars. Um, uh, Brettanomyces is the, is the, sorry, Brettanomyces is the yeast that eats the wood sugars, whereas the regular yeast doesn't eat uh, it was a regular yeast, yeast, the regular sugar in the wine. So you may also, as a fault, you may get some sparkling or bubbling from the Brettanomyces yeast. And that's one of those things, Brett is one of those yeasts that you want to eliminate as best you can. Yes, I'm one of those guys that like this, that, that like to have a little bit of Brett in your wine, but honestly, it's like an infection. It's like you, you, you want to prevent it as much as you can. Um, then you have bacterial fermentation. So malolactic fermentation, that's truly the second fermentation okay but that's one of the things that can may happen in the bottle if they didn't let it go through malo, malo lactic fermentation in the tank or in the or in the barrel and that's where the malic acid turns into lactic acid okay so the malic acid is the the acid that you gives you that appley taste and the lactic acid gives you that creaminess um, so there is a second fermentation that will happen with the yeast where it converts the malic acid. So it's not the sugars, it's the acid that's converting into another acid. Um, with bacterial fermentation, you want to try to prevent that um, if you're not looking for that type of fermentation. And the way you prevent that is doing a SO2, so uh, sulfur dioxide, in your wine or filtration. Now the filtration, the idea is that it's removing the bacteria from the wine. Um, so there isn't anything left to attack the malic acid if that's what you want to leave it with that. Uh, blending. There's another way to get bubbles in your wine. Um, and this is definitely considered a fault. Um, when you ferment 
different wines and if you don't like put everything into one vat or one one big barrel to uh, ferment um, if you f ferment say maybe it's by vineyard or by varietal or whatever um, when you blend them together two things that may be kind of inert and not uh, ferment you know fermenting anymore they may mix up and kind of go you know the yeast in this wine may go, ooh, look at all these things that we can play with in the yeast from this wine. Look at this, the, the stuff in the, the other wine and go, ooh, let's have a party, okay? So the, they, even though this, the food, the sugars in their particular wines, they're done with that, something new gets introduced and it's kind of like, ooh, what's that? It's kind of new, all right? Okay, um, you can't talk about sparkling wine without talking about Dom Pierre Perignon. Uh, one of those rare times I actually put, you know, born in, you know, when, when the person was born, when the person died. But just to give you perspective, so from 1630 to 1715, first of all, the guy lived pretty old. But this is early on, um, and he was brought in. Now, everyone talks about he invented champagne. He didn't. He was brought in, really, to prevent the bubbles. All right, the abbey he came to... Um, the, the abbey that he got hired by in the Champagne area hired him because they were having these problems where in the spring that dormant yeast, and they didn't know what was going on at the time, but that dormant yeast was eating those sugars and inside the bottle all these bubbles were happening. So you have your cellar workers working with the bottles and if they do something wrong with the bottle, they drop it, all of a sudden boom, 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 you have chain reaction. Um, upwards of, I read 90% of a chateau's or, or a winery's production could be destroyed from just one little mistake because all the bottles start exploding against each other. Well, if he didn't invent it, then what was so great about him? Okay, he he pioneered a lot of things with how winemakers make wine. Um, he pioneered the concept of Blanc de Noir, so getting a white wine from a quote black grape, which Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier are red grapes or black grapes, that's how the French call them, and getting the white clear juice out of them. Well, almost all wine or grapes produce clear juice. There are a few out there that produce red juice and they're a red grape, um, but basically they're all pretty clear. So he pioneered in getting just the juice so that there was little to no skin contact um, with the wine or with the, with the juice. Cultivation. The whole idea of cultivation and just uh, trimming the, the vine so they were no more than like three, well, like three feet off the ground, um, that helps you with low yield, um, helps you manage your vineyard a lot better. Uh, he also pioneered harvesting in cool, damp conditions, kind of like morning, okay? Not like, but like, like you get in the morning. When you harvest in the afternoon or when it's hot, um, sugars are elevated, acid is down, is, is dropped. Um, the, the grapes are more easily damaged when you pull them, you, you pluck them off the, or you, you cut them off the vine and you're throwing them in the bin, in the basket. You know, you have a lot more chance of those, of those grapes because it's hot and a little bit weaker in bursting. Uh, speaking of that, rotten or overripe grapes. He pioneered just getting rid of them. They're not worth making the wine out of. They're going to destroy the wine. Uh, he also pioneered really not using feet. Now, I'm not saying that up until that time, everybody was using feet, but he really was one of those people that was like advocated using a press. Now, what that does is gives you a more even uh, press of the wine, whereas somebody just stomping on the grapes, you don't get as uh, more even, even uh, bursting of the grapes. And then he used what is a natural process, what we would now call organic. Except organic people are a little bit more fanatical about it, whereas that's just how they did it back then, okay? All right, so um, who was the first to actually intentionally do a sparkling wine? Well, depending on who you're talking to, um, it was done in France, the uh, Blanquette de Limoux, uh, in 1531. So, you know, Dom Perignon was born in 1638. Uh, so, like 100 years earlier, the south of France, that's where this is located, it's the Abbey in Saint-Hilaire, 
uh, southwest France near Carcassonne, um, which is north of Catalina or Catulia, uh, which is the northeast part of Spain. But um, that area of France, they were intentionally producing sparkling wine. Uh, England is another place that you, you see as far as the um, history as the pioneers of the people that first started intentionally doing sparkling wine. What they would do is they would take, well, first of all, <clears throat> sorry, the reason that they could do that was they created bottles using coal-fired or coal-fueled ovens. And that created glass that was stronger than using wood-fired ovens. Um, they also rediscovered uh, using cork stoppers, so using cork in a bottle. Limu also did do that. And this gives you a better seal. Um, it stays in the bottle better than, than what they used to use. And what they would do is they actually just kind of took rags, stuff them in there, they'd, they'd coat the rags in oil, um, and they would sometimes like cover them in like tar and wax to keep the, the rag in there. So that way the wine would, would stay better for a little bit longer. So they found out the ancient Romans used cork. That's what they used in their, their, to stop their stuff. So their wines would actually last a little bit. So England was uh, a pioneer in using that. The gentleman that kind of explained how all this worked was a scientist named by the name of Christopher Merritt. In 1662, he presented a paper to the Society of Scientists, whatever, in England. And um, explaining how the wine was created. Uh, and then you also have a poet, Samuel Butler, in 1663, he wrote a po poem called Hudibras, and he called the wine brisk, which meant that it was frothy. All right, so what are the methods and how to create the wine? How is it done? You have the method champenois, uh, or the champagne method. Um, it's called method traditionnel outside of champagne. Now, up until recently, um, there's all these agreements on what you can use and what you can't use inside of countries, inside of uh, economic zones, and even from country to country. Uh, champagne is one of those protected names. Because if you buy a bottle of champagne that says champagne, you want to make sure it came from champagne. Not it, not it came from my backyard and I infused some CO2 into it. Um, so you want to make sure it's that way. However, we have a tradition in the United States that... Uh, we're gonna do whatever you want, right? You know, the pioneering vision and all that, go west, young man. So um, the United States, after all these agreements were written and everyone said, yeah, 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 you can't call it a Chablis unless it comes from Chablis. You can't call it a Burgundy unless it comes from Burgundy. Well, or Champagne. The US said, well, we're gonna create this class called semi-generic. So it's kind of like a grandfathering thing where they're like, hey, we were using Champagne before all these agreements. We kind of want to still use it. And what they do is they put like American Champagne in front of it. So it still says Champagne, but they try to designate that it came from the United States, not from France. All right, the second fermentation is in the bottle. So we already talked about that. Um, the other thing they have to do is they have to age the wine for a certain period of time on Lee, or Sir Lee, which is the dead yeast cells. For a non-vintage Champagne, it has to be 15 months. For a vintage, it has to be at least three years. Now, a lot of these Champagne houses will age these wines for longer than the bare minimum. You also have it called riddling. Now riddling, and this is kind of where uh, it gets a little dangerous, um, what they do is they, the, the, the wines start at a 45 degree angle. And what happens is every day or every so many hours, um, or at least a few times a week, somebody from the winery, as I'm dripping water, somebody from the winery goes into the cellar and they give it a little bit of like a uh, little shake, a little bit of a turn, and then they increase the angle of the wine bottles. And what that does is it helps, um, it helps uh, uh, break apart the sediment or the yeast that maybe have stuck to the side of the bottle and then it slowly goes down to the neck. Um, once they've, once everything is done and everything is just straight down, okay, once they have it straight down, um, they do what's called disgorgement. Now, there's a few ways to do it, but one of the ways that is done, a little more of a quote, commercial aspect, is they will take the neck of the bottle and they put it into a freezing, uh, sorry, a frozen solution of brine. And what it does is it freezes that part of the wine and it actually freezes all the yeast cells. And what they're able to do is get that out, that disgorgement. Um, 
Once they do that, though, they have to do what's called dosage. Now, dosage, actually, what they do is they, they, they put it back a little bit of sugar um, and sometimes a little bit of the still wine, the, the, un, the unsecond fermented wine, into the bottle. And what that does is it helps um, restore some of the wine that was lost during disgorgement. It also helps them control the sweetness level of the wine. We're going to get to that in a second. Other methods. So you have a couple right here. Well, actually three. Uh, Metodo Italiano, what's called the Charmat, Charmat process. What they do is they do the second fermentation in the stainless steel tanks. Then they bottle it under pressure. So they keep the pressure from the stainless steel tanks and they bottle it. Um, it's slightly cheaper than doing it in the champagne method. Transfer method. Now, they do the second fermentation in the bottle. They transfer back to the stainless steel tank. Um, they have, well, first of all, they have to have at least ferment in the bottle for six months to call it bottle fermented. Transfer back to the tanks. Then they do their filtering and they add the dosage to, to the bulk wine and then they rebottle it. Then you have gas injection. That's basically how you get, get carbonation from your soda. So they bottle it. It's, it's not going to go through any more fermentations. They've, they've killed that off and they just inject CO2 into the bottle. All right, vintage versus non-vintage. All right, so most wine house, champagne houses do non-vintage champagnes. Um, but if they're going to create a vintage champagne, they have to follow a few rules. First, just regular EU law for a vintage is that all the wines have to come from, or 85% of the wine or the grapes have to come from that year. And champagne has to be 100%. So if you get a 2005 vintage of champagne, it's all going to be 2005 grapes. If you get a 2005 Bordeaux, well, only 85% have to come from 2005. But most likely in 2005, most of them came from, more of them came from uh, that year. Uh, Champagne law also requires that at least 20% of a vintage wine, of the still wine from vintage, is held back. And the reasoning for that is so that you have wine to use in future releases of non-vintage wines. Or you can even, well, yeah, yeah, it's 100%, sorry. U.S. law is that 95% of the grapes have to come from that year. Non-vintage. This is most of the sparkling wine that's released. It's a, um, sorry, it's a non-vintage thing. So what they do is they take wines from different vintages, they mix it up, and they create a blend. They create a house style. This is very common in scotch and whiskey. Um, they take multiple years and you'll have like the 18 year blah 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 and all that. Well, they don't really do that type of labeling with, um, with champagne. They also do this with ports and sherries. Um, but um, they create this blend. Um, most of the base wine though will come from that year. So they you know they don't put the 2012 vintage on there. The, most the, the year that that non-vintage is released or the year that's supposed to be uh, most of the wine comes from that one year. Um, I didn't have already talked about it. The rest of the wine comes from multiple years and they create a house style. How sweet it is. All right, so the first sparklers they created were, were actually pretty sweet, like very sweet. Um, over time, as the quality of the wine improved, they started reducing the sweetness to allow you to really enjoy the wine. Um, the Russians, though, really liked... Uh, the sweetness, and when the Russian Revolution happened, also that was also pretty uh, right before the whole Great Depression. But the Russian Revolution happened, and really, the market dried up for these these wines because you know the champagne, especially back then, was I wouldn't say not uncommon wasn't was uncommon in a household. It was still kind of an elite, or the rich were the only ones that could afford champagne. Um, Brut is now the most common uh, level of sweetness around the world, and Americans especially. So what levels of sweetness do we have? You have uh, from sweetest to less sweet. Uh, du, which is sweet or dulce, or dulce uh, in Italian, has to, be, has to be at least 50 grams of sugar per liter. Demisec or semi-secco um, is 33 to 50 grams per liter. Uh, dry, sec, or secco, so we're just dry, um, is anywhere from 17 to 35. You're going to start seeing some overlapping in the upper and lower numbers of these things. 
Uh, extra dry, extra sec, or extra seco is 12 to 20 grams per liter. So you could have a dry or seco uh, wine or champagne or sparkling wine and decide I want to market it as extra dry because you it's at 17, okay? Uh, brut, again, this is what we normally have, is from 0 to 15. Extra brut, 0 to 6. So you have to think about it this way. The maximum grams per, per, grams per liter of sugar is 15. Uh, the maximum for extra brut is 6. And then brut nature uh, has no added sugar. So it's whatever naturally occurs from 0 to 3 grams per liter. Um, that's really about it for sparkling wine as far as how it's produced. Now, we're going to go through, and I didn't put a slide, I don't know why I didn't, but let's go through some other sparkling wines out there. You have in Italy, you have Prosecco. Um, it's a sparkling wine. Uh, you also have Aste Spumante. Um, you have Moscato d'Asti. Now, it's not, all, not all Moscatos from Italy are sparkling, but you have Moscato d'Asti, and they, it's a, like kind of a semi-sparkling or frizzante, so kind of a semi-sparkling wine. You also have Sect. That's from Germany. Most sect stays in Germany. They don't really export a lot of that. Uh, you have cava in Spain. Cava is produced throughout most of Spain, but the Penedes region is really where the majority of the cava is, is, is created. England, of all places, is starting to become a place that's really putting out some, what's being what I've been told or I've read, some halfway decent sparkling wine. I'm really interested in trying to find some of that and trying it. Um, and then there's sparkling wine made in other places of the world. Americans make sparkling wine. Um, and the use of American champagne has started, is, 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 not, is not as much as it used to be. Um, it's pretty much just, they call it sparkling wine. But um, one of the things I, I want to also mention in my research, and I was my, my first edit in Wikipedia, by the way, um, is that um, EU law does allow uh, you to put CO2 into the bottle. And you have to label it that um, you added the CO2 in there. I forgot the exact phrase. Um, but somebody in Wikipedia said it was against EU law, but I found the law. Actually, you know, I did some, you know, government, uh, what, government um, analysis. Uh, what, what in the world is that guy? How does he say it? Um, government legislation analysis. I did some of that on uh, wine law. And um, it's right there, plain as day, that they're allowed to add CO2 to a wine and they just have to label it that way. That's a kind of a basic overview of sparkling wine. Hope, you understand, hope it made things a little bit more um, clear on how sparkling wine is made. Uh, remove the myth of Dom Perignon. Not that he didn't, wasn't instrumental in wine making, he just was trying to prevent the bubbles, not he didn't invent the bubbles. All right, so that's going to do it for now. Um, as always, click the links above to friend me up. Click the links below to check out the sites. Uh, hit the donate button to the right, uh, drop a couple ducats, and we'll see everyone again next time.